This is a Rattle and Hum Sports podcast for Wednesday, May the 14th. It's another edition of The Muscle and the Mouth. Uh, this is The Mouth, Brian Houston, and we've got the muscle and the brains behind it all. Kelly Hitchcock from KH Fitness and Tyler, again, longtime fitness trainer, uh, owner and operator of the uh, Fitness Center. And uh, Kelly, thanks very much for being with us today. Uh, you gave me the inspiration. You saw this, and, and it. Uh, we're going to use this as a... Uh, a platform right now to answer some of the most commonly asked questions uh, that are that you guys have to answer uh, by people that come into your gym to work out all the time. Okay, right. Well, thanks for having me again. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of questions that people that they they kind of have an idea about what they need to do, and unfortunately, with all the information available today, it kind of gets confusing on what's really true and what's not. So maybe this will help people if they, you know, want to take a paper and pen out, and it will uh, help them to reach their goals, I think, if they know the way to get there. Okay, now I know the first question is usually what is the best way to lose weight. If, from your perspective, it's about losing fat, okay? So what is the best way to lose fat? Right, you know, a lot of people come in, they go, I don't really care what I weigh. It's just a number on the scales is what I want to get down. And it's funny how, you know, losing weight sometimes can be the worst thing for us because we're, we're not being specific about what we're losing. And a lot of times the methods that we use as far as low calorie or low carb, uh, the majority of weight that we tend to be losing is coming from water and from muscle mass. And uh, you'd never want to lose muscle. And, you know, any, any program without a concern for muscle is a program designed to fail from the beginning. Uh, the best way to lose fat is to increase your resting metabolic rate. The resting metabolic rate is the amount of calories that you burn in a 24-hour period doing nothing, sitting still in a chair. Now, what determines that is your lean body mass. How much muscle do you have on your body? Uh, it's like a bigger engine in a, in a car. The larger the motor, the more gas that motor drinks. And the same thing for our body. When you are sitting down, the more muscle mass you have, the more calories you burn at rest. So that's the most important thing is lean body mass. When you lose weight, don't lose muscle. Make sure that all the weight is coming from fat. And by increasing lean body mass, you'll accelerate the amount of fat that's being burned. Okay, and so in doing this, you're talking about uh, increasing your muscle mass. So that means weight lifting and weight training. And then you're also talking about your diet. So it's a combination of the two. It's not one of these things where you can just go on a diet and lose what when we stand on a uh, you know on a weight scale, uh, lose whatever number there is. There, there's there's more to it than just uh, hey I went from two. 10 to 200 sure you know and the, the main thing that we tell our clients is we don't really focus on the weight on the scales that's just a number but what we do focus on is the body fat and uh, we want to make sure that when we are losing weight that it's all coming from fat and not from muscle and there's a very specific way to do that is there an ideal uh, body fat percentage for a man and a woman, is there a particular number? Or is it all individual determined by each person? Well, there's different ranges. Uh, you know, I would say on the extremes, let's just say for an athletic person, an athletic man is probably going to be anywhere between 8 and 12%. An athletic woman would probably be around 15 to 20, somewhere in that range. Okay, so I'm way off from there. But, so. then, but then, you know, you do have the extremes. I mean, I have women that I train to get ready for fitness competitions. And the the figure girls or the bikini girls, they usually get around 7% body fat. That's really low. But they're only at that level for probably about two weeks, okay, because that's kind of approaching dangerous, low, dangerously low levels, uh, whereas men bodybuilders can get down to 25 to 3%. So that's on the extreme. But in general, around... 15 to 20 for a woman and 8 to 12 for a man. All right, and, wh and what is the average percentage body fat of the person that you work out with when they come to you the first time? Ooh, that, you know, that really varies because we, you know, I see athletes, but then I see people that have, you know, heart conditions or, or diabetes. Uh, I, you know, I, I would say probably the average, probably of most men is around the average 20%, and I would say women anywhere is maybe 25 to 30 percent somewhere in those ranges so they've got to almost cut it in half though pretty much yeah yeah and that takes work and dedication it takes like you said a synergistic approach between the weightlifting and the nutritional plan okay very good the other question here that uh, is one that's on this list is if i lift weights this is one women always have. men never right. ask this question but women always want to know if i lift weights will i get bigger muscles because they don't want to get big and bulky well you know weight training will give you potential and i'm going to quote an old uh, texas coach daryl royal he said but potential means you just ain't done it yet <laughs> so 
you know, you're stressing the muscles in a way that potentially will, they will become stronger and larger. Uh, but what's going to determine the outcome on where they end up is going to be uh, determined by the, the nutrition support that you provide. Now, as far as women worrying about getting really big muscles, I'll always use the, uh, I have a little line that I use. I say, you know, worrying about building muscle is kind of like starting your job and worrying about making too much money. I mean, it's just probably not going to happen. Uh, women, what determines muscle size is testosterone levels. And they have plenty of studies out that within the first uh, eight weeks of taking a sedentary person uh, and eight weeks of strength training, men and women, the interesting thing is that as far as the strength percentage-wise, it's pretty much even. Women gain as, gain as much strength as men do. One major difference is the muscle size. And the men, uh, they build a lot more muscle quicker. And that's just due to the testosterone levels. Now, the strength that we're seeing with men and women is coming because you, you are increasing neural recruitment. You're stressing the body in a way that the brain is having to send a stronger electrical impulse, impulse to the muscles that are being used. So strength-wise, you're going to see an even, pretty much even percentage strength gain. But muscle size, the men are going to gain muscle a lot easier. So for women, you really got to, that means you've got to push it even a little bit harder than the men on the weights to get what you're wanting. So the women, there's just one more reason for you to hate men. Well, you know, it, you know, well, it could. Now, you don't, you know, of course, the men don't, the women don't want to look like a man. Right. So we're, and we're we safe. don't want you to look like a man. either. Exactly. We're not. That's not our goal either. Yeah. So uh, but no, women need to do a lot of strength training and not only for the muscle, but for the bone density building uh, 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 things that accompany weightlifting. OK. And, and now let's take it a step further. Uh, we're talking about uh, getting bigger muscles. Now, when you're young, you want to see how just how ripped you can get. You want to get as big in the arms as you can possibly get. Usually you're looking for six-pack abs. Then you, when you get to be my age, uh, you've pretty much given up on that goal. <laughs> and so then it's just a matter of trying to get as lean and fit as possible. So what are the different strategies? Let's say you want to be the, again, you want to be the, look like a football player when you're in your 20s. How do you go about doing that compared to uh, when you're in your 50s starting to just get lean and healthy looking? Well, you know, we need, we need to train smarter, not harder. We need to look at what the goal is. And, of course, as we age, the, the training does need to change. Uh, we need to be sure that we're doing exercises that are more controlled, uh, make sure that our form is correct. Uh, when, you, when you're younger, you, you do a lot more explosive-type lifts, like, say, power cleans or hang cleans, snatches, heavy squats. As you age... I believe that you need to, to vary those up. I mean, I'm not saying you can't do those specific movements, but I wouldn't do the weight that you were doing when you were in your 20s. And I would also get fit before you do that ballistic type movement where you're exploding with a weight. You want to be safe. Um, I think also that, you know, what we're looking for is to not only be stronger, but to have more muscular endurance. So there will be days when we lift a heavy weight, but for higher repetitions. So it's more like a 70% of your max. I also was going to ask you, so uh, you could literally, no matter what your goals, one day you may be lifting heavy weights and lower number of reps. Is that correct? And then another day uh, lift lighter with a higher number of reps, you know, uh, 15 reps or something? Sure. I mean, there's a, there's a principle called muscle confusion. And what, you, that, what that means is if you just come in and do the same old thing every time you come in, then your muscles are going to adapt to the stress that's being placed on it. What we want to do is change that up a little bit. And that may mean sometimes coming in and doing, uh, I would never say 90% of your max, let's say 80% of your max for six to eight reps. And then there may be days when you come in and do 70% for maybe 10 to 12. There may be days when you come in and do drop sets, supersets, giant sets. I mean, we can change it up so that, you know, there's, there's probably 10 different ways you can work your chest before you get back around to the same exercise. And I think it's very important that we use a variety, especially when we get older. Now, younger, you know, again, it's about specificity. If it's football, then we're going to be more specific. If it's golf, there's going to be certain movements that we focus on. So training should mimic as closely to what our goal is as possible. I mean, if it, like I said, if it's, if it's being a, if you're about to climb a mountain, I mean, there's things that you can do that can simulate that in the gym so that it'll help you better at climbing that mountain. Is there an ideal number of days per week that you should lift? For a beginner, we recommend a couple days a week of weight training. Just to be, a couple. Just, just a couple, just to begin. You could split that up. Uh, 
Now, when you do just two days a week, are you working out the entire body in both the workouts? Usually what we like to do is split the body up where you might do chest, shoulders, and triceps one day. And then the next time you come in, you may, be do, you may do legs, back, and biceps. On your days off, you can come in and you can do calves, abs. You could ride the bike or walk on the treadmill. But just give yourself some variety. And what we want to do is we want to start you off not in a way that you feel like you're overwhelmed, but leave you wanting a little bit more. And then after, say, a month, then we kind of will start to increase it a little bit. And we may do three days a week. And if we do three days a week, Let's just say it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Monday would might be chest and triceps. Wednesday might be back and biceps. And Friday would be shoulders and legs. And, you know, depending on how much time you're wanting to put in, I always recommend just doing your cardio right after that, which we're, I think that's another question mm-hmm. we'll get to. But, uh, you know, with your, with your cardio, you're only talking about 15 to 20 minutes after post, post-workout. Okay. Okay. Um, My son, for instance, is a high school football player. Right now, he lifts almost every day, and he lifts, uh, works out his entire body, but he does different exercises every day. So, so for instance, he may do one particular exercise for his chest one day, may do something completely different for his chest the next day. Is that a wise thing to do, or what is your recommendation? Usually the way the coaches have it set up is you're doing, it's called closed-chained exercises, and those are... Those are exercises that it's usually free weights. It it might be kind of known as functional training, I think, in just the gym world. Uh, You're using using free weights where your feet are on the floor and there's an explosive component to it. Uh, In other words, you're not using machines. Uh, What what you're doing with that is you're getting better neural recruitment for explosiveness. uh, It's not so much a type of exercises that build muscular hypertrophy, which is growth, size, it's more a matter of building muscular power, strength, and those are two different things. And I think that, you know, again, the specificity of the program. Now, what the coaches probably have him doing is probably not doing chest today or bench press today and incline chest tomorrow. They probably have him doing a couple of chest exercises today, and then the next day maybe his squats and a power clean day, and then they may go back to the chest day. But it's always good to put a day of rest. I wouldn't work a, a, the same muscle two days back to back. Okay, and when you say that, so he shouldn't be doing a chest workout two days in a row, regardless of the exercises. Right, because anytime you you work a muscle, if you're working it correctly, there's going to be some damage there. And the strength and the growth doesn't come from the actual movement that they did that day. It comes from the the repairing of the tissue the next day through the rest. That's why rest is so important. Uh, Take me, for instance. I usually only hit one body part once a week. Mm-hmm. chest once a week back once a week legs once a week because the recovery process is so important all right and now i'm going to ask you another thing uh the the philosophy of first of all lifting to failure uh, is that something you should do all the time when you let's let, let's say you do chest press okay so you're doing a bench press and you just lift to exhaustion is that a smart thing to do or should you keep it at a certain number of reps regardless and stop or what's your philosophy on that well in the beginning you're you're not going to go to failure in the beginning we're going to kind of get an idea about what you lift and we can do that there's a process we go through to to figure that out and we're usually going to stick with a real basic three sets of 10 like say three sets of 10 bench presses three sets of 10 flies and maybe three sets of 10 cable crossovers Mm -hmm. but you know the the muscle adapts really quick and once you become, once you have a certain level of fitness, we need to, we, we need to up the stress on the muscle because the muscles uh, adapt really fast. And so then we might start going into going to failure. Uh, we may even start doing drop sets. And what a drop set is, let's say we bench press at 120 pounds. We might get eight and fail. We can drop that down to 100 and we can get maybe six more. We can drop that down to maybe 60 and get six more. That's taking the muscles a little bit past failure. But now these are very advanced techniques, mm-hmm. and, and this comes well into your training. This isn't something that somebody would want to start uh, from the very beginning. So to answer your question, no, in the beginning, don't take each set to failure. But as you advance, yes, you're going to start going a little bit closer to failure on each set. All right, and then there's also the debate about uh, the amount of rest between uh, sets. Uh, I've seen anywhere from 20 seconds to two minutes of rest between sets. What, uh, what do you recommend? 
you know, again, the rest periods are very specific to what the goals are. If you are a power lifter, uh, a power lifter is going to do anywhere between, I would say, two to six reps. And they're going to rest anywhere from two to five minutes in between each set. Because with a power lifter, the goal is weight. And I want to lift as heavy of a weight as I can possibly lift. So you're lifting a weight that will only allow you two to six reps. And that, there's a huge neural that is a huge neural impact that type of training does. It's going to stimulate as many muscle fibers as possible to get the weight up. Due to you're only doing two to six reps, there's not going to be a lot of muscle fiber damage. And, and, and without the damage, you don't have a lot of hypertrophy. You don't have a lot of growth. So although powerlifters are going to be a little bit bigger usually, they're still not as big as your bodybuilders. And that, a lot of that has to do with the training. The reason why you're resting so much is because there's a, you know, we hear that our body works off of fat or off of carbs, but, you know, at the uh, maybe macro level, what we're working off of is called ATP. It's Anderson triphosphate, and it's a fuel product at the end of the Krebs cycle that actually either your, uh, your, your carbohydrate or your fat, depending on what you're using, will be converted into ATP. ATP requires a little bit of time to be replenished. And so we want to let that to we want to let that those levels re, re, uh, replenish so that we can lift as much as we can on our next set. So that's powerlifting. Now, if you're trying to put on a little bit of muscle mass, and I mean, I kind of train my clients like bodybuilders because it's a great it's a it's a good rep range. You're using usually around seventy to eighty percent of your max. It's heavy, but it's not too heavy. Uh, and usually we rest anywhere from forty seconds to a minute. I, I really don't want the ATP stores to completely replenish. I want to jump right back into it, and I want to kind of do more damage to the muscle fiber. And that sounds horrible. It's not macro tears; it's micro tears. So mm -hmm. you're not you're not tearing a muscle to where it needs surgery, but you're having these little tiny hair-like tears, which recover and become stronger and larger, which increases your resting metabolic rate. With with short rest periods like that, not only are you affecting the the structure of the muscle. But you're also, you're working the cardiovascular system. I mean, I, I've had clients, we'll put on a heart rate monitor, which we can download into a computer afterward. And if you'll look at the, the average heart rate, you know, what was maintained over an hour period, that heart rate usually is going to end up being around 70% of their max heart rate, which ideally, that, that's the best heart rate for all of us if we're working on uh, cardiovascular fitness. We, we've kind of gotten off track with, as Americans do, with thinking more is better. And uh, that's why I think the, the cardio has kind of gone crazy as far as the amount that we're doing. And that might be another question, too, that we can get to in a minute. But, yeah, you, I think that, you know, a little bit shorter rest periods as you get more fit uh, is, is really the best way to go. All right, very good. We're going to stop now on this particular topic. And we'll take a, a break from that and then maybe come back next week and continue these conversations about some of these most common questions that trainers get asked in the gym. But uh, great start so far, Kelly. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brian. All right, now where can people go to get more information from you? You can email me at khfitness at aol.com or you can go to our KH Fitness uh, Facebook page. That's one word, KH Fitness. And you can send me messages on there. You can also see some pictures of some of our competitors, uh, even just some of our clients that have made some major changes. Outstanding. And, of course, you can uh, send me questions. You can go to my Facebook page, uh, Brian Houston, uh, or you can also uh, uh, get me on Twitter, at Brian Houston, B-R-Y-A-N-H-O-U-S-T-O-N. You can hear all these things on rattlinghumsports.com. Kelly Hitchcock, the uh, muscle in the mouth. I'm Brian Houston. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.